Welcome to the Innovate for Impact podcast. As usual, we've got Tracy Newman and Dan Bentley. And today we're really excited to be joined by Imogen Aitken. Uh, She's from the Starlight Children's Foundation and she's the National Program Manager. So welcome, Imogen. Good to have you here. Thanks so much for having me. It's an absolute pleasure to be here. Excellent. Well, we always like to kick off with just getting you to tell us a little bit about who you are and what you do. Sure. Um, so my name is Imogen Aitken. I'm the National Manager, focusing on program innovation at Starlight. Um, and my role covers a couple of things. Uh, on, the, on the one hand, I work within our programs team, so our team that delivers our services to seriously ill and hospitalised kids right the way across Australia. Um, and within that team, I lead our program development, program innovation um, area of focus. So that means at any given time, um, we're looking at how we can stretch our, our wings, I suppose, as an organisation and expand our scope into new areas of program delivery. Um, so, for example, for the past couple of years, a fairly logical focus has been on how we might deliver programs to kids when we can't be with them face to face, as was a context that came up um, quite readily in the pandemic context um, in past years. The program development area of focus for us has looked at expansion beyond the space that we hold in the hospital, our style and express rooms and out onto the wards, for example, and that's now a very well embedded part of our program, expansion into offering services for families when they're outside of the hospital context as policy changes, for example. Um, So that's one part of my job is uh, working closely with our executive team, uh, with the head of programs, our head of programs, who kind of help set the agenda for where we might want to stretch and expand our reach, um, and driving that through and, and doing that in a fairly classic innovation way. We do lots of work to understand customer needs, our end user needs, and then we test lots of things, we see what sticks, we in, uh, we in, uh, what's the word I'm looking for here, we um, iterate and we kind of come to a process, we land on something that works really well and then start to operationalise that thing. So that's certainly a big part of my, a big part of my role. Um, And to do that role, I work incredibly closely with members of our, of our frontline team, our team on the ground. So my team's actually typically made up of that team, that frontline team who jump onto projects um, that are aligned with their area of work and we really work things up in a very exciting way. Um, The other part of my job is looking at innovation more broadly within Starlight as a whole organisation. So that includes for for parts of our organisation that are programs focused, for example, our internal supporting functions like our finance teams, our um, fundraising teams who are externally focused, our Marcoms teams. They are all their own incredibly uh, successful entities within Starlight and they've always been incredibly innovative um, operators. Uh, I guess part of my role looks at kind of the the cultural string that might pull innovation um, right the way through all of us as an organisation and get us into a place where we feel positive about the word, where it makes sense to us as an organisation, but also whether where it's really adaptable to our different roles. And we find that we've got teams that have varying levels of expertise with, with what innovation practically looks like. Our digital fundraising teams, for example, are completely on the front foot in um, kind of user-led design of fundraising campaigns and programs. And that's been the way that they've worked for a very long time in quite a formal way. Um, And then that's juxtaposed against some teams for whom uh, it's not as easy or seamless a fit into a kind of BAU part of their role to be trying new things and and experimenting. And so, yeah, part of my work um, kind of works at that more cultural cross-functional level to see what innovation might feel like for us as an organisation. That's really great. And that's that's really a, a lot of what we wanted to talk to you about today because um, Starlight is very well known and very well regarded for its innovation capability. And we're really interested in hearing more about some of the things that you've done that have worked really well and how you've been able to kind of develop that innovation culture right across Starlight, particularly, as you said, you know, in areas where uh, it's perhaps newer to people and getting them, you know, to go from, well, you know, this is kind of my job and it's innovation, someone else's job to, hey, we're all innovators and that's just how we work here. So um, we started on a formal innovation journey, I suppose, around the, the specifics of the word innovation quite a few quite a few years ago now. We, um, we started in... Um, quite a deliberate space of thinking, well, we need some innovation capability in-house. We need people who understand what innovation practically means. And at that time, that was looking at things like 
I don't know, what does it look like to apply human-centred design practices in our world, et cetera, et cetera. And we landed in a place where our first kind of cab off the rank was to train up um, a group of internal cross-functional team members as innovation champions. That's kind of how we got going um, with innovation. And to be honest, in that early stage, there was a view that maybe that is the group that work on big cross-functional projects from right the way across the organisation to draw great outcomes. We've evolved quite significantly um, since then, but that was our real starting point. The gold of that starting point is that it really did start to introduce um, a kind of shared mindset on what we want innovation to be to us. So we worked with a partner called Inventium, a a consulting firm who um, really helped us as an organisation kind of solidify our language around innovation the, the, the definition of innovation, for example, as change that adds value became really resonant um, and useful to us as an organisation. It's obviously a great definition because it, it does apply to absolutely everyone's role and it covers that full gamut from BAU, incremental innovation, that people are doing absolutely all the, all the time, right the way through to big disruptive stuff. So we kind of loved that. Um, it also kind of introduced us to the broad brushstrokes concepts of putting the customer at the centre of everything you do, testing, exploring, making sure what you're doing is really working for them. And so from that starting point, um, we've we've really worked hard to evolve to a place that's less connected to an individual team who do innovation, but rather to an end goal where everyone kind of recognises that at a base level, what we're talking about when we're talking about innovation isn't this big, scary pie-in-the-sky concept, but rather is just do we understand what the people we're creating this thing for want from it you know are we meeting their need or are we actually meeting something that comes from us and maybe isn't gonna isn't gonna align or work well and have we made sure that the thing we've come up with really works for them have we tested it a bit to figure out how they use it whether it works what they do and with those quite kind of broad and I'm reticent to say the word slapdash what am I looking for here but with those quite kind of messy concepts um, that can be really open to interpretation. Okay, maybe I'd take back the word messy, but those concepts of do you understand the need of whoever you're doing this thing for and (laughs) have you tested to make sure that the idea you've come up with actually works? That's the place we've got to that feels like it's become really sticky for people. It's taken some of the sting out of out of the word innovation and everyone can apply those two things to whatever they're doing whether it be an internally facing project of oh we're adapting to a new system for doing x through our it team okay let's make sure is it going to meet the needs of the people who are using it and if we test to see how they use it before we go the whole hog right the way through to obviously our externally facing programs those two things just feel like they've really settled now for us and people have made the connection that, oh, that's what innovation is. And, of course, that's relevant to me. Now, I've kind of taken us on this linear journey. I don't think we could have got there without the more formal starting point of this is what innovation is, here's what the definition is, and here's a process to understand it through. But we had this squiggly line in the middle where there was this bit of reflection, you know, does everyone need to know a full end-to-end technical process for delivering on innovation in our world? Actually, no, they don't. Those two concepts and the way that they can be tweaked, twisted and applied to anyone's individual role became far more important for us and I think really helped in making innovation feel super relevant, um, super relevant to everyone in their role. Um, The other couple of interesting things that happened along the way is that that language that can feel a bit spiky at first started to really settle for people. So I know we've talked about those concepts of understanding the needs of the people you're doing things for and testing with them before you implement. We have had to wrap some quite specific language around them. So, for example, we use the word customer at Starlight, um, and that is a sticky word for us. We don't have paying customers at Starlight. We have a whole wide range of stakeholders who engage with our stuff. And even the word stakeholders feel sticky for us because, to be frank, the people we do things for are kids in hospital. (laughs) So the word customer does not naturally align with them. They come to us to have fun, not with us to give us their custom, with us to have fun, have a great time, have their experience in hospital brightened. Um, And so the word felt really weird to us as an organisation at first. We tried to find another one. But we couldn't find one that made sense in that context as well as in the context of someone who might feel more like a formal customer, um, you know, a vendor that we're working with. Or, for example, if, you know, again, the word customer isn't quite right here, but all our donors, you know, maybe engage with us in a a more customer style relationship. Um, And so, yeah, we explored some others, but none really worked. Stakeholder kind of felt too 
business et etc 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 and so we just had to embrace the stickiness of customer and kind of have some I, I, I want to use the word fun have some fun with the fact that the word doesn't quite work for us and just own it don't try and force the word say we know this feels like a weird word and that's literally what we say in you know comes about this stuff it feels like a weird word and let's be transparent about why we're using it we can't find a better one if someone can give us a better one we'll go down that path but let's use this word in the meantime and actually even though there might be a better word out there, we haven't had to get to it because everyone now recognises, oh, customer, that weird word doesn't work for us, but yes, it makes sense. And I actually think it helps with memory recall there as well because it feels a bit anomalous. People suddenly think, oh, yeah, that word. Oh, and this is what we mean by it. We just mean meeting their needs. So, yeah, there's been some interesting journeys in there. I love the idea of having fun with innovation because that – a, so it closely aligns to your whole reason for being because, you know, Starlight is all about having fun. But um, when you're actually having fun with technical concepts and introducing new ways of working for people, if you can actually let them go, oh, this this doesn't feel comfortable rather than kind of trying to force comfort on people it gives them a bit of an opportunity to as you say play with it um, be a bit uncomfortable and it's kind of great to see that that's recognized right across the organization as well like it's not like well you know it's uncomfortable for you but it's not uncomfortable for me like it's just everyone's going yeah we're all in this together and we're all doing the same thing at the same time what are some of the other things oh sorry I was going to say as well that I, I also really like the fact that you, it's so non-perfectionistic, like your way, like you're really role modeling what you're asking people to do from a cultural perspective. So you're saying, hey, we're going to put this out there. We're going to test this word. We're going to see if this word works internally. Doesn't matter. We haven't got it hundred percent right, but we want to just do this so that we can sort of move forward and we can sort of see, does it actually do what we want it to do? And that's very similar to what you're asking people to do externally in the innovation space, right? You're actually role modeling some of those behaviors of, hey, it doesn't need to be 100% right for us to move forward. We will test this. If we find something better, we'll change it, you know, but I love that alignment too. I don't know whether that was purposeful or maybe that's just how embedded it is in your culture now that you're doing it at all different levels. But I thought that was pretty cool. Yeah, it might be a bit of both. But actually you've just reminded me there's a, that, that premise helps us out in, in from a cultural perspective all the time. I mean, another example is a bit of um, work that I did um last year I don't know how what's been happening in the pandemic maybe the year before um where we were looking at supporting people managers specifically with this word innovation and what it means to them in their teams and it's a challenging thing for people managers um you know some of our people managers on the program side are managing massive teams they've got big operational workloads effectively to to push out every single day at hospitals across the country um and so to then have this piece of the puzzle that comes in that says also you have to be really open to ideas that are coming to you and you know this it's how do you get that balance right is a is a perennial and interesting challenge um and so that group um I mean we're starlights people are positive people at starlight people are always on board for you putting forward but there can be a healthy kind of "Mm, what's this is going to mean a lot for my workload what's this going to mean for me etc etc so we put together a an L&D piece for want of a better word for that group um, and I was quite nervous about how it would land and also how it should best be delivered. So I actually did the same thing as we did with that word customer. We basically brought a group of those people managers in to kind of co-design this thing with me with a view that I'd mapped out the scaffolding and the kind of core concepts we we're going to include there. But as you say, instead of saying, hey, this is the thing I'm going to teach you and this is the thing you have to apply, it was more like we think this kind of works for us. Can we work on it together? And all of a sudden you have people who um, – you know, are feeling a little sticky about this this kind of entry into their working life, sometimes becoming the biggest advocates for um, for these pieces of the puzzle, which is really an exciting, which is really an exciting thing. And it takes me to the other thing that I love personally most about innovation. It's how I kind of came to this area of work myself, um, and it genuinely rings true for me even when building new programs and things like that. Which is that if you understand the customer needs, I never really have any grand designs on exactly what the solution is. <laughs> you know, I don't care what it is. <laughs> we just want it to be the best thing that delivers, you know, that meets the need, that meets the outcome. It takes so much pressure off not having to say that's a bad idea and that one's a good idea. I'm just saying, who cares, you know, whatever we get to, we just want to do the thing that does the job best. And that was a real light bulb for me, moment for me in my previous career, you know, before I even came to all this stuff and kind of changed my whole working life um, so yeah it's been exciting to be able to apply that in a fantastic organization like this one 
I, I couldn't agree more. There's just so much pressure that's removed when instead of having to determine and decide on the best output a best approach you can actually go hey why don't we just test it and see what works <laughs> you know like how much better is that like rather than always having to get it right you can actually um just let it go and let the data tell you the story rather than you know needing to know all the answers yourself yep data insights our kids you know our most important group so yeah no it's been a a really um a really fantastic evolution for sure Starlight also have implemented some some other structures that have really helped in terms of innovation, like some some actual pieces that you've included to kind of support that culture. Do you want to talk a little bit more about some of those? Yeah, sure. I mean, I know I've been here just espousing this. It's just broad brush. We have, you know, are you meeting a customer's need? Are you doing this? But actually, we actually have quite a formal um, set of artifacts in place to support support this stuff to actually happen. Um, so one is we do have trained innovation champions across the organisation. Um, so 25 at the moment, that group kind of ebbs and flows in its size, truly cross-functional. People who have actually genuinely, you know, been trained in a full end-to-end innovation process, I understand innovation from a really technical perspective, and then are also supported to take, twist and tweak and pull out the bits that apply most to their teams. Um, Another key innovation in the innovation world that has really paid dividends beyond, to be honest, what I was expecting of it was the introduction of our CEO Innovation Awards. And the reason I was not wary, I'm reticent to say wary, but I was interested to see what awards would do. I think they can go in a couple of different directions Um, and they can make people feel quite distanced from the concept if for example only certain projects are seen to win awards Um, but the way that the awards have ended up panning out has been really interesting and I think it's largely due to the innovation of our CEO Louise and um, Felicity who's our head of programs which is that the categories the broad prospects categories for the awards really do make sure that we're capturing the full gamut of what innovation can feel like for us as an organisation. So there's an award that's focused wholly on simplification innovation, which which does capture incremental BAU work that's happening right the way across the place um, to keep pace with change, to make things great. There's something that focuses on an individual person and less specifically on an outcome that they've driven, but more on their style of working. There's a focus on... Um, obviously some projects that are that are you know breaking new ground but I do think particularly those first two categories have meant that we've been able to spread um, the feeling of what innovation practically is and means beyond oh it's just that project that's winning for being the coolest most innovative thing Um, and so they've been a useful a really useful tool and I think a testament to the fact that awards can work you know that celebration that that calling out can work well I think if done right Um, A couple of the other pieces of the puzzle we have in place, we have a a large team of captain starlights um, here at Starlight who are our our hospital-based team. Uh, They don the captain's uniform, come down from planet Starlight every day to bring fun, distraction, joy, laughter to kids in hospital. Um, And they're in every children's hospital right the way across Australia, lots of them. They do an absolutely amazing job. Um, And one thing that's interesting for that group is they're not office-based, None of them work full time and they're all really busy all day long, every day. <laughs> and so connecting back into some of this nice, ah, oh, but what is it, you know, what's the real user need? Don't necessarily have time to sit down and think for long periods of time or work things up um, on a big piece of paper or whatever that might look like. Create have created um, something called the Captain's Innovation Fund, which is which is a classic, I guess, um, you know, innovation funding model. Basically it it calls out to captains um, to recognise opportunities for improvement, change new things in their day-to-day. They then submit in and, and can have their idea funded, built up and then and then executed right the way across the country. Um, and actually um, our team called The Hub run the Captain's Innovation Fund and um, sent through to me this morning um, just the um, application process that's in there and I just loved having a good look at it because I think um, one of the key things, it's a really easy application. Captains can submit in any form, way, shape um, that makes sense to them. So they can send in a video, they can send in a voice memo, they can draw a quick picture and send it in, whatever that feels like. And But one of the key questions asked is, is what is the impact of this thing? What needs it meeting? What have you seen out there that means this thing will be useful to you? And I know it feels logical that that would be in there. Um, 
But I think sometimes you can just get in that zone of thinking, I think this is a good idea because I think this is a good idea. And that, that simple step back and cross reference has meant that absolutely fantastic stuff comes out of that fund. Um, I, I mean, there's some stuff that applies to the captains in their role themselves. So something that's come through the fund um, is like a, a, an addition to a captain's belt that allows for the holding of specific magic tricks. So previously, it's a classic job to be done gap. <laughs> captains were having to juggle lots of stuff in their arms as they were walking around the hospital. Um, there's things like games that are created, you know, that can go in that belt as well. So I think one of the challenges that was coming up is that all kids like playing different card games. You've got to if you've got a game with you, kids aren't necessarily going to know what it is. Some kids will like it, some kids won't. And so we've created our own really simple to understand and learn little, effectively, little game of memory that's branded with starlight things that every captain can use and you know every child can connect with. So those sorts of great ideas come up and can get implemented really quickly and easily in a way that otherwise wouldn't be able to happen. They're not, um, they're not necessarily going to come up as big kind of strategic innovations, but rather as things that make you know, support us to do a better job at doing what we do, support them to do a better job at doing what they do. So that's another kind of formal, um, I guess, artefact that we have in place as an organisation um, that helps us, you know, um, kind of drive that this innovation thing lives and breathes for us. Um, another couple of things, and we've kind of been experimenting with these, so they're getting off the ground as we start. One's the innovation insight session. So we have quite a big culture here of sh- trying to share broadly across the organisation about the stuff that we do. So in the programs team, for example, every month there's a um, an opportunity to come sit down and hear for anyone across the organisation, dial in and hear about what's been going on in our team. So it wasn't a stretch for us to add this into that repertoire. The insight sessions are literally team members talking about a way that they've applied innovation in a way that makes sense to them. And those people are not experts in innovation. They're not necessarily speaking to technical innovation work. But I don't know, we had a couple of examples. Um, Jackie, our team member who who built our new website, basically did a whole session on failure and how she'd gone down a gone down a you know a weird path and pulled back around. And Laurie, who's one of our live wire facilitators uh, who works with teenagers, did a whole session on how interesting it can be to actually understand what teenagers want from us because you know it can be hard to get to the bottom of. Um, and so those sorts of things also help kind of build that connection point for people that oh that's the way it could be relevant to me. Um, to me and my role Um, and then we also do have formal L&D I suppose Um, this is a more recent addition for us we didn't um, for a long time didn't have L&D for everyone across the organization we use kind of innovation champs as the means of dissemination and building that that cultural piece and that did a fantastic job it's it's not massively fleshed out L&D but it is a starting point at Starlight so when you start at Starlight there's a piece of the puzzle that that introduces you to what innovation means to us as an organisation. Um, all this stuff that I've talked about here, basically. Um, and there's a piece for people managers as well um, that looks at some of those stickier things, like what do you do when someone comes to you with an idea? How do you tackle that if you don't have the space to do it? Or, and how do you then not squash what might be a really exciting feeling? So um, we do have some formal formal L&D in place as well. So, yeah, a few kind of formal artefacts that exist alongside it's so interesting isn't it because you sort of see all those formal structures um and what they actually create is very fluid and very uh, you know it, it, it's cultural and it, it's not necessarily something that you can point to and see but all of those structures actually support that culture because it gives a whole broad range of messages in a whole range of different ways so we talk all the time about you know storytelling and the benefit of sharing those stories across the organization and particularly you know the the unpolished stories because you know if you want to set up that culture where people embrace failure if you only ever share stories Stories of wonderful program successes that are grand scale, it really doesn't make it accessible. Um, so, you know, combined with those categories in the awards, combined with, you know, giving everybody an op- an opportunity to share innovation stories, whether they be successes, whether they be large or small or part of their job or part of a project, like that's, that's sort of capturing all of those different stories. I really like that. Yeah, big time. I think storytelling is a great word for it. I think... Uh, it's interesting. We use the word storytelling widely at Starlight. It's a key part of our culture um, in terms of advocating for the work that we do and and its impact. Um, 
it of course attaches to innovation as well. I think we're taking its key tenets and applying it, um, applying it here. It probably is, if you if I really think about it, is probably at the root of what we're doing, right? We're just sharing stories about how how people do things, you know, and how it works for them and what great outcomes um, come from come from that. And I mean, I think an important thing to note is that we are still a reasonably large organization with um, you know, lots of moving parts. So it's not that we're all just wafting around constantly able to attend directly to customer, you know, to user needs all the time. Of course, there are sticks and forks and things that throw up that slow us down or speed us up or send us in a different direction. I mean, I think a a key thing that I think has helped, uh, it was a thing that we developed for that people manager's piece of the puzzle um, that didn't feel very innovation at the time, but I think has helped really bring it, to a place that feels realistic for people is one of the questions we get people managers to reflect on if they're thinking about, oh, what should we do with this great idea that's come up is, is it a strategic priority for us to tackle this thing right now? Um, and it's reasonable that the answer to that might be no, <laughs> you know, because um, I think you can get stuck in a space where you feel like innovation means you have to take on everything and uh, if it's a good idea, you have to go with it and you have to make it happen. And that's hard to do when you're a big organisation with um, with moving parts. I think it's very reasonable to have that, that strategy question in the mix. You know, is this something that's worth it to us right now or not? Well, it's also, it's also very hard to do for smaller organisations too because they just don't have the resources to do all the things. They have to really pick and choose which of these things are going to have the biggest impact on the people that they support and their cause. So... I think that's uh, it's an important call out. One thing, one thing that I've loved hearing about, and anyone that regularly listens to our podcast would know we talk about this a lot, is about systemizing innovation. I really like how what you've done is that you haven't made it a special project that happens every couple of months or something like that. You're built it into the way that you work. It's part of the organization's DNA. You know, even in the way that you're communicating with your staff and working with your internal staff, also how you're working with your, you know, your customers. Um, everything is, you've changed the culture to work in this way. And that's the most important thing that we're trying to drive through to our listeners and the people that we work with as well at the moment is, is that that's how you become an innovative organization is that it's not about the occasional activity. It's about having this fund and this support network for your captain starlight. You know, it's about having the training and the tools there for those people who work in your organization to be able to join and go, hang on, I want to be a part of this. How do I up, how do I get upskilled and and then join in having these processes so that your CEO can just have awards so that, that she knows that that um, innovation is happening across the organisation all the time because she's getting these nominations coming through and you know you know it's happening because you're getting these ideas come through from the captains you know like it's it's all a big system it's processes structures resources that's how you do it I just think this is a really fantastic example. It does. It is super systemized, and you know, it, it's um, it's happened by design. But also, uh, the things that have really worked have kind of come raised themselves up, I suppose. Um, but you're right. I mean, the the benefit of some of these more systemized pieces are that they allow for us to track stuff, you know, which is which is useful to us. <laughs> Important it allows us to measure things, uh, measure our outcomes. And so, I mean, on that on that note, one thing that Inventium introduced us to. Um, was a kind of framework for thinking about how to build up a great systems systems approach to innovation it includes things like do you have a process that people can loosely connect to? Do you have a climate for innovation? Do you have the capability for it? Do you have resourcing? Do you have strategy behind it? Do you have role, you know, et cetera, et cetera? And we actually um, do have those things mapped out with with some metrics next to them. They're not formal metrics necessarily, you know, um, or they're not – some of them are really, I guess, qualitative metrics versus quantitative metrics um and i think you know every now and again we kind of drift into oh do we need to more formally should we be tracking sort of dollar numbers out there so what should we be tracking there i think i think we're still in a place of trying to figure that out exactly i think we know for example that our um look our fundraising and marketing team at starlight are just leaders in in the field and to be honest even without this innovation wrap around because of the nature of the job are really good <laughs> Uh, looking at what what's working and what isn't, and and shifting and tweaking, and uh, that's look that's a, a thing unto itself that just does uh, that I learn from every single day. And then the application we we in programs can learn a lot from as well. We obviously work in a really different state where we don't have constant feedback. That's an interesting thing about Starlight. Kids love what we do, no matter what it is. <laughs> so it's actually really hard to get through to what's working, what's not, et cetera, et cetera. So um, 
I think having some of those formal artifacts in place, and yeah, they're they're kind of soft measure, but we can we can get a sense of of what's happening and how things are how things are going is a useful um, is a useful outcome. And and you're right, that's been something that's been on my mind recently. Um, we've had this focus on simplification. You know, um, the pandemic seemed like a useful time to see what we could kind of strip back and streamline. We had some some wiggle room in our capacity, I guess, and we were kind of tracking it quite formally, but then we've realised actually the simplification submissions to CEO Innovation Awards tracks that really nicely for us. You know, are we reinventing the wheel by tracking things twice? So there's always those little um, considerations that um, that come up as they go. But, yes, it, it has become a really nice systems-wide approach and quite different to even as recently as 2019, you know, we were tackling a big um, programs project and we thought, you know, the initial thinking was, great, the innovation champions will work on this project, the 16 cross-functional people, and it, it, didn't, it didn't work, you know. And now, and now one of my projects, I never think, great, I'm going to get 16 people from the finance team, the Marcoms team, to be our innovation people on this project. But I'd now think, great, Captain Starlight will be great to help me out on this because they exa- understand exactly what's happening in that space. So it's been, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's been a fantastic journey to get there, but it didn't feel really, it wasn't all really, seamless that came out this way we had to test different things ourselves um, ourselves too Um, and then of course sorry now I'm backtracking in case anyone listens to this because there are of course some fantastic people in those other teams who contribute amazingly to the programs projects I'm always trying to mine for their for their insights too so no it's been a great um, it's been a great evolution I think it's just that what that shows is that it's more about being flexible in your approach rather than um, you know rather than the actual outcomes, it's more about like, let's adapt to what works rather than um, setting in place a formal structure and then always following that because that's the structure you've got in place. It's like, well, here's a structure. And then as you as you work with it, you go, oh, actually, this bit works better or no, that bit doesn't work so well. And so then you just kind of adapt and move towards it, which goes back to that thing that you were saying in the beginning, that it's just all about the outcomes. It's not about how you actually get there. Um, and when you lose that attachment and your focus is just on, well, how do we get to where we need to go? You've been able to, you know, change that um, and make the most of all of those different things and and what works floats to the surface and what doesn't work, you just adapt and do something different. Um, I like that. I I like the, um, and sort of going back to um, uh, how you were talking before about, you know, it's not always perfect. You know, when you're actually talking about a large organisation dealing with very complex needs and a whole range of customers who uh, are in, you know, a whole range of different situations, I'm sure that there are times where, um, and and also Starlight is an organisation that's been very, very successful for a very long time. And also to your point, whatever you do, the kids love it. It's fun. It's gorgeous. It's wonderful. You know, Captain Starlight's amazing. So sometimes you must find there's a bit of change resistance or at least maybe not so much at Starlight, but you would expect that any organisation that's successful, been around a long time, that that people are nervous about changing something because it already works. So how have you been dealing with that? Yeah, I think um, it's an interesting thing. I think we, as an organisation, I speak to the programs part of our organisation, um, we're open-minded, very open-minded and excited about new things. That's That's been a cultural artefact for us for a long time, I think way before my time. I think what we don't like doing is turning things off. <laughs> so <laughs> what, we, what we don't like doing is saying we've got this new thing and maybe that means this other thing isn't quite meeting the need anymore and we can adapt and shift our focus to this new thing over here. I think our natural comfort zone, because of the nature of our work, is to think, but there's one kid that loves that thing. We've got to keep that thing turned on. Um, And so we can end up with just lots of stuff kind of coexisting at the same time. And I still, um, I still, uh, you know, again, I think that kids' behaviour often does that job for us. They'll kind of shift to the newer thing <laughs> um, on our behalf. And so it can be, it can actually be easier than you might expect to then let that other aspect melt away. Um, but I also don't think we, uh, you know, I think we don't really have a formal approach for how to do that. Sometimes we do just have to make it as a strategic call and leverage the fact that, well, we're moving to this thing for these reasons. And I, I, I mean, I think some very... Um, 
core parts of, of great people management are what help us there, maybe more than more than or in tandem with with good innovation practice you know things like providing as much transparency communication bringing people into the tent about why something's happening I think that does that job just as well as the fact that oh we've done this big test and it's shown us this because sometimes it, it, it doesn't quite do it I mean an example at the moment is um you know, thinking about Starlight's program delivery in the non-face-to-face context, we've actually done that for a long time within the existing children's hospitals through a television channel, a bright television channel that exists in each hospital. It's done a fantastic job for a really long time. What we're obviously thinking about is whether the digital world can help us to um, to kind of expand our reach in that space, I suppose. And, um, you know, what we've been able to do is have an MVP operational that's that's told us a lot about kids' behaviour. And so where we, we might feel really connected to the to the television, and it'll still do a core job for, for us, um, we can see that kids can get so much more engagement with us <laughs> once they can be unpinned from kind of a passive device. And so that easing starts to happen more naturally than formally needing to say, we're not doing this anymore, we're doing this thing now. And so, yeah, maybe it is that the innovation process helps us too, but I think if we didn't tack in there or layer in there, kind of real transparency about why we're doing things, what we're interested in. And, I mean, to be honest, the thing that makes my life easier and more exciting on that front too is that I build out all these things with our frontline staff. I don't know. <laughs> you know, I, mean, I don't know what the exact best solution is for doing X. I can sit down and talk to kids with them. I can work. But but those insights are what help get us to that, to that end outcome. So I feel like I haven't had as clear as succinct an answer to that particular question than um that I might otherwise have. I think it's a mixture of all the logical kind of people management stuff that allows or change management stuff that allows for change to happen feel really positive, coupled with the fact that we can let our customers lead the way um, in helping us make that change gets us there. But, um, yeah, I, I, as with any organisation, it's always challenging to change things that are, core to, that are core to the way that people do their jobs. Really good. Thank you. Well, uh, I think we've covered some really amazing, amazing ground. Um, was there anything else that you wanted to make sure that we talked about today, Imogen? I don't think so. I feel like I've just, you know, gone to all sorts of places. Yep, yep. We, we talked about change. We talked about language and jobs to be done. We talked about the cultural journey and the artifacts that have supported it. Um, yeah. Was there anything that was missing? I felt like my final answer to that last question wasn't as... I don't know, punchy as it could have been, but to be honest, it's not. All, it's also just not quite my. You know, I'm I'm not I'm not the expert in people management, basically. But we seem to do we seem to do a good job of it. You know, we've got great people managers. <laughs> I think is what it comes down to. For me, the money shot was well. I don't, we don't have uh, we don't have to convince people to change because they've been involved in the whole process the whole way, and <laughs> you know, like that's it. Okay, excellent. Look, thanks so much, Imogen. It's been such a delight talking to you. And I, I know I'm really excited about the work that you do. Um, and I, I'm feeling much more comfortable with using the term customer. <laughs> I don't know. There must be a different word out there for the not for It's just hard to do, have the one that's a catch-all for everyone. Yeah, right? We hear client. We hear client a lot. Clients. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A client's not quite right for us. But maybe if I'd come in with client, it would be right for us. I have no idea, right? I think it's just the thing that got to us first has become the thing anyway I, I think what what you've shown is that something doesn't have to be perfect to be uh an innovative and it doesn't have to be perfect for you to work with it until you get to something better and um you know just that real power of focusing on the needs of your customer versus um you know what it is that you're looking to do internally and some of the success that that's been able to bring about at, at starlight so thank you so much Thank you. Thanks for having me. Thanks, Imogen. Cheers.